Once again, I want to welcome everyone to today's Meeting of the Minds webinar. I'm John Sandblom, one of your hosts, and we have Kate Swaffer, the other host. Hi, everyone. And of course, our esteemed guest, Dr. Alan Power. Hi, everybody. And please note that DAI webinars are not medical advice or, and are never to be construed as medical advice or a substitute for seeing a, a physician in person. And we also want to re remind those, uh, especially those that are working and professionals, that while this webinar uh, does not provide professionals with credits for learning, we are working on this option for future seminars of this nature. Dementia Alliance International has paid an additional fee to support such a large number of, number of registrants. Uh, and although this is a free seminar, it would be appreciated if those of you in the audience who are employed would consider making a donation if you did not when you registered. And uh, this says with, of a minimum of $20, I would say anything you can afford to donate is greatly appreciated. Uh, DAI is still an unfunded, not nonprofit charity, and we need and appreciate your support. Kate, was that the last slide I need to do? Yeah, that, that's the last one. And then uh, you've got the notes for introducing OWL. That would be great. Okay. Sorry, I should have had that right here. Of course I didn't. There we go. Okay. Our, our guest is uh, Dr. Al Power. Um, he has a new book, Dementia Beyond Disease and Well-Being, and our looks at the experience of dementia through the seven domains of well-being. I think. Sorry, that noise threw me off. And joy. Domains that are universal across ages, cultures, and abilities. In this webinar, webinar, Dr. Power will examine each domain and explore how each is challenged, both by the intrinsic brain changes and by our attitudes and care systems and how we can use the transformational approaches to restore each domain, even for people with advanced cognitive change. Uh, Dr. Alan Power is an internist, geriatrician, and clinical associate professor of medicine at the University of Rochester. He is also a certified Eden Alternative Educator, a member of the Eden Alternative Board of Directors, and an international educator on transformational models of care for older adults, particularly those living with changing cognitive abilities. Dr. Power's book, Dementia Beyond Drugs, Changing the Culture of Care was named a 2010 Book of the Year by the American Journal of Nursing. Dr. Power's new book, Dementia Beyond Disease, Enhancing Well-Being, was released by Health Professions Press in June of 2014. So welcome, Al. 
Thanks very much, John. Um, hi, everybody. I um, set myself up so you can see some of the native birds of upstate New York. Um, you may see them flying by my head, but um, I do have actually a PowerPoint to share for those who like to see what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to move to uh, that aspect of the screen. Let me just get back to, oops, I just did something that made. I just did something that made the picture go away. So I now do not, oh, here we go. Okay, I've got it. share screen, there we go. Okay, share screen, okay. I think we're okay, can you see my screen? Oh, yes. Okay, good. This is uh, right down the road from where Kate is right now. This is the beautiful town of Verena on Lake Como, and I guess Kate is uh, not too far away, and I recommend seeing it because it's a beautiful place. But meanwhile, here's my PowerPoint. Um, and what I would like to do, we have a number of people on this call. I know we have people here who are living with a diagnosis of one form of dementia or another. We have professionals. I'm assuming we have some family members as well. And uh, so what I would like to do is uh, not spend our entire available time necessarily uh, just talking. I would love to have lots of discussion, hear from people about their own experiences, what they think about what I say, what works, what doesn't. Uh, so what I would like to do from a time format is really try to wrap up in 45 minutes or less. Um, that does mean possibly uh, glossing over some things. We can make a PDF of this talk available to those who need it. And uh, if I'm speaking too fast for anyone, please uh, get in the chat box and John or Kate can let me know to slow down. I am from New York and so that can be an issue. Um, what I would like to do, what I propose to do is to sort of take you on the same journey I've followed for the past decade and trying to come up with a new understanding of this constellation of experiences we call dementia and explain uh, how I got the way, the way the way I did in thinking about this, talk a bit about that well-being model that John mentioned. There probably won't be time to spin it out in great detail, but I have some slides at the end that we can expand on if time allows. Um, yeah, I, I, I have one quick thing. The way you did the screen share, just to let you know, um, by sharing your desktop, I think if you go out and then actually choose PowerPoint makes the screen, the, the, uh, PowerPoint slides larger, if that matters to you. I don't know if it uh, Well, I think it's important for the people. Uh, now I have to figure out once again how to... Uh, go up to the top and, and click Stop Screen. Ah, thank you so much. Yep. Uh, all I have is share screen. Oh, I see. There it is. Yeah, and then okay. use the PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Does that... Uh, let me get back in mode. Does that help? If I do this, oh, I guess it's about the same. Sorry, I thought maybe I'd make it bigger. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's the way my desktop is configured. Okay, well, it's, it's we... good for me, Al. Yeah, okay. that's fine. All right, uh, I did not uh, invent anything new. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a neurologist. All I did was take a very old illness and try to look at it in different ways because what I was doing wasn't working for me. And uh, so I love this quote by Marcel Proust that the only true voyage of discovery is not to visit strange lands, but to possess other eyes, to behold the universe through the eyes of another, of a hundred others, to behold a hundred universes that each of them beholds, that each of them is. Um, very quickly, and I know this is an international call, I'm gonna talk about a few things pertaining to the US, but I've tried to make this as uh, international as possible. But this is where I come from, so you might as well know what's going on in our country. US sales uh, of antipsychotics uh, for all causes have gone through the roof. And believe it or not, the number one drug sold in the U.S. last year by cost was Abilify. Yeah. Yeah. There are over 10 participants in the meeting. Okay, I guess people are being shut out. Um, and uh, as you can see, that is generic aripiprazole, $7.5 billion in U.S. sales. Now, uh, prescriptions also have gone up to $60 million last year. About 30 prescriptions for every adult living with schizophrenia. Um, and uh, although there are many reasons why antipsychotic drugs might be used, we know that there's only one population that's increasing more rapidly than the U.S. population. And that's older people and people living with dementia. And as you can see, nearly 30% of all antipsychotic prescriptions in 2011 were dispensed by long-term care pharmacies. 
Um, overall, currently, uh, about 19% uh, of all people in U.S. nursing homes are taking antipsychotics. Remember, the government counts all people with and without dementia, and those without are much less likely to be given these drugs, so they dilute the numbers. We're still looking at nearly a third of people in U.S. care homes taking antipsychotics if they have a diagnosis of dementia. And what I love, uh, Medicaid uh, Public Assistance Insurance Program spends more money on antipsychotic drugs than it does on antibiotics or heart disease medication. Now, the first big secret, I'm going to share some secrets with you. Uh, I like to talk about things that people don't talk about. And one of them is that this is not just a, a U.S. problem. Uh, some of these studies are really fairly old, but they're fairly representative. As you can see, the numbers uh, in care homes are pretty similar within the uh, high-income nations of the world, still approaching about a third of people with a diagnosis of dementia. Now, the reason I got into this business is because as a doctor, I prescribe these drugs for people. I've worked uh, in long-term care settings for much of my career, much of the last uh, 25 years. And uh, what I found was that these drugs were not doing what I wanted them to do. I could almost always quiet somebody down but to actually uh, give somebody some relaxation, engagement, enjoyment of life didn't seem to be happening. So I began to challenge this. And one of the things I did was I read the studies in great detail, which as a busy doctor, I never had time to do. And I found some amazing things. The first thing is that every study that's ever been published that shows a positive effect of these drugs was sponsored by the company making the pill that was being tested. Now that may not automatically invalidate a study, but it does uh, lend itself to various biases. And these studies, it turned out, when I looked at them carefully, are very flawed. And, um, oops, let me go back. I seem to have uh, advanced too quickly. Um, and uh, two independent studies showed little or no benefit in people in care homes and people in the community, people living with uh, what appear to be delusions or with physical reactivity during care, uh, little or no benefit. But the amazing thing is that even if you ignore the many flaws and biases in these studies, uh, they still show only maybe a 15 to 18% improvement at best. And when you realize how flawed these studies are, you realize even that number is probably a, a gross overestimate. On the other side, there are many risks. The ones on top of this slide are the things we've known about since the old days when we had drugs like Thorazine and Melaril, some of the early antipsychotic drugs that came about in the 1950s. But now that we've had the newer drugs, which were uh, felt to be safer, we have found uh, some new symptoms we didn't know about in the 1990s. Weight gain, elevated blood sugar, increased risk of pneumonia and stroke. And Clive Ballard in the UK, over a three-year study, showed the double mortality rate compared to placebo. And there are many studies now showing independent increased mortality with an average increase of 60 or 70%. I often ask doctors in my talks, if you had a patient with pneumonia and you could prescribe an antibiotic that might work 15% of the time, it could almost double the death rate, who would ever give it to their patients? Well, of course, uh, we don't do this because we're stupid, but we see people who truly have distress, their care partners are distressed, and people come to us and say, do something, and we don't have a better pill to give. Well, that leads us to the second big speaker, which is very important, and I'm going to talk once again about the U.S., but my feeling is that this is also um, probably uh, prevalent in all the countries who are on this call. Uh, we have a lot of media attention about our care homes because that data is tracked through nationwide demographic uh, reporting. Uh, but the limited data we have suggests that the magnitude of the problem may be even greater than the community than in care homes. We have a couple of small, not very diverse studies out there. I did an audit of the people at St. John's, a very large care home where I used to work. Uh, where I looked at 200 people who were living there uh, who I had moved in with a diagnosis of dementia, and I correlated a Folstein mini mental state exam, a very rough guide of cognitive function, with medications they were taking at home. And I found that people that had the lower scores, uh, 10 or less out of 30, the more advanced uh, uh, cognitive change, of those people, 50% of them, half of them, had been taking antipsychotics in their own homes before they came to St. John's. So once again, uh, the absolute number of people who are taking antipsychotics is probably much higher in the community, probably two to three times as much. And that's a problem for me because there's so much attention being paid to our care homes, and yet there's no media attention, no education for people who live in assisted living or in the community to uh, understand the risks that they are also taking by using these drugs. So this is not a care home problem. Our approach to dementia reflects universal societal attitudes. And my guess is 
whether you live in Australia, Europe, Canada, New Zealand, other places around the world, you probably see a similar pattern. I would love to just say this and stop presenting those first several slides, that antipsychotics are just plain ineffective and dangerous. And in fact, in the research I've done, there really is no chemical rationale for using these. These drugs are meant to block dopamine, which is often, uh, which is felt to be a major component of schizophrenia, excess dopamine activity. But there's no excess dopamine in dementia. And in Lewy body dementia, the one where people sometimes have visions that are referred to as hallucinations, this once again has nothing to do with dopamine. It's circulation to the back of the brain, the visual cortex. So there is no rationale for using antipsychotics. And in fact, it's particularly dangerous in that population. But in my mind, antipsychotics are not really the problem. There's a bigger problem, and that is the problem, the notion that people need a pill if they are d distressed or expressing themselves in ways that we feel is uh, not uh, our usual standard. And so I think it's beyond antipsychotics. It's changing our mindset about who people are and what they are expressing with their words and actions. So what I call the pill paradigm, I think comes from some deep-seated societal patterns and beliefs. First of all, stigma. And we're going to talk quite a bit in the next few minutes about stigma, which I think is huge. There's a component of ageism and ableism. Our societies tend to view older people with less value, and people who are less able are valued less. And as a result, uh, those who are often older and less able, which is a lot of people living with different forms of dementia, have less value as well. We have a desire for the quick fix. Uh, certainly in this country, relentless marketing of pharmaceuticals is the answer to all our needs. And this is all fuel fueled by a narrow biomedical view of dementia. And this is what has dominated our thinking about this syndrome uh, for the past several decades. So what is that model? Well, we describe dementia nowadays most of the time as a constellation of degenerative diseases of the brain. It's viewed as mostly progressive and incurable. We focus on loss and deficits, disease, deficit, decline, death. Our policy is heavily focused on the costs and burdens of care, and most of our funds are directed at drug research, certainly in this country. And that's really what our national plan is all about, is about the cure and about funneling money into further research uh, for better medications. Now, I'm certainly not against drug research. I do believe that we can come up with better ways to uh, change the course of this illness. Um, it's more the relative attention paid to drugs versus other aspects of education, support, and care that bothers me. And while none of the things on this slide is technically wrong, it is a very narrow, limited view of uh, what we're calling dementia. And when there's a limited view, there is some dangerous fallout that occurs, and we see this all the time. Here's some of the fallout. First of all, we look almost exclusively to drug ther therapy to provide well-being. We think that that's the only path to a life worth living once you have the diagnosis. Our research and our, I might say, our policy discussions largely ignore the experience of those people living with the diagnosis. And if you read my blog, you know I just was railing about the fact that our national plan is looking for one person with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's to be on their advisory council. One person with one form of dementia, one perspective, to represent five million people. And we know that there's no other uh, focus group of that size that the government would ever purport to represent with one representative. Uh, we're very quick to stigmatize people. We use phrases like the long goodbye or people are fading away and we actually dehumanize people in doing so. We very quickly disempower people. We create institutional disease-based approaches to care. And when we see people who are distressed, we blame it on disease. So we even have the term BPSD behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. And those of you who know me well know that I've been speaking out against this terminology recently because really what this term says is the person is upset because they have brain disease. And when you believe that, then your solution is to give medication. You don't understand that there may be other historical, environmental, relational aspects of the person's world that might cause their distress the same way it would distress any of us and that to blame it on a changing brain is uh, short-sighted. Uh, to just add my point about this, I don't think dementia is totally absent here. I believe that when there's a component of dementia, what it does is it, makes, it may affect people's ability to cope or their ability to communicate their needs. But I don't believe it's the root cause of most distress. I think most people become angry, sad, anxious, for the same reasons you and I would in a similar situation. And so we miss our component of causing or bringing about this, um, this ill-being in the person. 
So we have an advocacy challenge. And after I spoke out about this at ADI, uh, Glenn Rees, the incoming president, uh, had a discussion with me. And, and he was very concerned about this uh, uh, because he understands the, the danger of stigma. And, and he talked to me about how do, I, how do we impress upon the public that this is a serious condition? How do we educate, advocate, and support, but not use stigma? How can we talk about this and not increase stigma and fear, not diminish or dehumanize the people we wish to support. This is a very fine line that we have to walk, and it's important that we uh, think very carefully about how we do this, because we don't want to cause more harm than good. Uh, as David, David Everson, an Australian researcher, said a few years ago, um, I'll paraphrase him, that if we really believe the person is fading away, what happens to our ethical obligation to give that person humane, respectful care? that kind of goes away too because the person's not there anymore. And I'm not suggesting that rampant abuse, but I'm saying that there are little ways that we often diminish people or discount them in ways that we would never accept for ourselves because of that label of dementia. Here's a few quotes to sort of explain from the perspective of people living with the diagnosis. Christine Bryden, whom I got to meet and uh, listen to at the Changing Melody Conference in Toronto before ADI in 2011, this is what Christine said. What is the cause of the stigma and fear? It's the stereotype of dementia, someone who cannot understand, remembers nothing, and is unaware of what's happening around them. This stereotype tugs at the heartstrings and loosens the purse strings, so is used in seeking funds for research, support, and services. It's a catch-22 because Alzheimer's associations promote our image as non-persons and make the stigma worse. Larry Rose, in his book, Larry's Way, about his life with Alzheimer's, said, I thought when I got the diagnosis that I would die before I made it home from the doctor's office, or in the alternative, be in the nursing home within a week or so. Such was the stereotype Alzheimer's patient that I had seen on TV. And Richard Taylor, from a DVD we made, which I'll tell you more about at the end, 20 questions, said, people say to us, we're going to die twice. We're going to die as ourselves, and then we're going to die as somebody that nobody knows. I don't believe this helps anyone, seeing people this way, thinking about them, and especially telling them, telling them with your eyes, telling them with your hugs, and telling them with behaviors that you used to perform and that you don't anymore because it's just so painful to see you fading away. I think it's at the root of most of the sadness, most of the stress that's in the hearts of caregivers because someone they love is fading away. They are dying right before their eyes. Now, the stigma uh, does not just occur later in stages of illness. And I'll tell you about uh, my friend Ed Boris, who lives on the west coast of the U.S., and my friends Dr. Nader Shabahangi and Dr. Patrick Fox uh, wrote a book with Ed about his life living positively with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And Ed tells an amazing story about his diagnosis. He was not sent to the doctor by concerned friends or family. He had no outward signs but could understand that several aspects of his thinking were not working. His ability to call up memory, words, uh, patterns was being affected. And so he took himself to the doctor, talked about his challenges, and asked for testing. Well, it turned out after all his testing, he did have a diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's. Unfortunately, the way he found out was getting a letter in the mail from his doctor three weeks later with the word dementia on top and information. So not a great bedside manner, I'm afraid. But Ed, being concerned, hopped in his car and drove himself to his nearest Alzheimer's support organization, walked in the door and said to the person at the desk, my name is Ed Voris. I've just been diagnosed with early stage Alzheimer's and I'm here for some resources and support. Well, the person at the desk said, where's your family? Where's your advocate? And he said, I'm here to advocate for myself. And the person said, come back when you're with a family member. I can't talk to you. He went to two other adult support type organizations in his city got the same answer from all three. So this is how quickly the slippery slope of stigma and disempowerment starts. All you have to do is say the words, I have Alzheimer's, and uh, people start to see you differently. Uh, Steve, who was on the uh, To Whom I May Concern webcast on this site several months ago, a couple of years ago, talked about his 10-minute uh, rule, that he will talk to people for 10 minutes and engage them before he mentions his diagnosis so that they will see him as a whole person before they start prejudging him. So there are other barriers to care and well-being that come from stigma. The U.S. Alzheimer's Association published a few months ago that doctors are informing patients of their probable diagnosis of Alzheimer's less than half the time. 
Now, they gave five or six different reasons for this, but most of them are related to stigma. Either the doctor's fear of causing upset, family members' requests that they not be told. Um, and, you know, the one reason I gave that you might not tie the stigma is that the doctor said, well, I couldn't be 100% sure of the diagnosis, so I didn't say it. But I'm a doctor. I've worked with doctors now for three decades. And I'll tell you, I've never known a doctor who was afraid to say what they thought was going on, even if they were not 100% sure. So once again, we're talking about stigma here. We also know that stigma is the reason why a lot of people avoid early detection. When you hear about people like Ed Voris, why would you want to go out and be identified early on if people are going to treat you like you're fading away and start taking things away from you? So people hide. It actually defeats our purposes to stigmatize people. And uh, Kate, who's on the call, as you know, talked about her conversation with her physician at the time of her diagnosis. And she often talks about how she was given what she calls prescribed disengagement. You're dying. Get your affairs in order. And it took some time for her to get over that and to say, well, no, I've got, I choose not to be dying with dementia. I choose to be living with dementia. And as a result, has become one of our most important advocates. Um, so why do we do this? We're not bad people. I'm not pointing fingers at individuals, but we have a paradigm for viewing dementia. And this is what gets us in trouble. And so as uh, Deepak Chopra once said, maybe instead of thinking outside the box, we should get rid of this box because it's a powerful one, this biomedical model. And it is so fixed and narrow that it's hard for us to think beyond it. Even using it as a reference point and trying to get outside it is a mistake. So at this time, several years ago, when I was struggling with how to do this, I began listening to another group of people. And I'm embarrassed as a physician to say that I did not give these people enough heed in my practice for many years. But these are the people I consider to be the true experts, uh, people living with the diagnosis. And I've mentioned three of them already, Richard, Ed, and Christine. Jim Mann from Vancouver is there. And uh, we now have many more people. If I get their permission, I can add their pictures, Kate and John and Mick Carmody and Helga Rora and and, uh, oh, there are people like uh, Sandy, um, yeah, that's right, <laughs> Sandy uh, Halperin and Michael Ellenbogen from the U.S., Susan Parrish uh, from Canada, people who are speaking out. And I realized that, that uh, this group of people had an experience that I could never 100% appreciate, and I needed to understand what they were saying. And even when people said things that didn't make sense to me, I needed to try to understand them. So I went back to square one, and I said I have to redefine dementia without judgment and taking this experience into account. So I went back and came back to square one with this definition of dementia. Dementia is a shift in the way a person experiences the world around her or him. That's all, a little fuzzy, a little flaky, um, and it may seem imprecise, certainly for a drug researcher it would be, but for most of us this is a better place to start because it takes away the judgment, it takes away discounting the person who is right there in front of you. And when I started playing with this fuzzy definition, it took me down a very different road. And some of the things that happened were I went from seeing a fatal disease to changing abilities. I remember Richard Taylor, when I first met him, saying, I'm not dying of a fatal disease. I'm living with a chronic disability. And I realized that people's experience was critical to understand. Um, and I began thinking about dementia as a disability or as a different ability and began thinking about the idea of ramps. And, and uh, very quickly, if a football player were injured and became paralyzed from the waist down and came to a building with a flight of stairs, he wouldn't be able to access the building because he couldn't get his wheelchair up the steps. But what we've done with our disability laws is created ramps for people. And I realize we're not doing this for people with dementia. And in this case, I'm talking about brain ramps or cognitive ramps. Whether it's your home or a care home, we're putting people in environments based on our view of the world, our schedules, our rhythms, our staffing needs, and we expect people with changing brains to adapt to us. And when they can't, we diagnose problem behaviors and give these dangerous medications. Imagine asking a man in a wheelchair to walk up the steps and lifting him out of the wheelchair. And if he falls to the floor because his legs don't work that way and he yells at you, imagine diagnosing a behavior problem and giving an antipsychotic. It sounds ridiculous, but that's exactly what we do in all living environments with dementia. So we say, okay, we need to give people a path to growth. We need to accept that they have a new normal, as Jim Mann would say. And we have to find out what are those needs. If we can't cure somebody, what are the universal needs we can fulfill? It led me to challenge a lot of practices, a lot of interpretations. It changed everything, basically. I'm going to skip over this for a lack of time. It'll be on your PowerPoint. Just three different ways of looking at the same expression. Uh, one more metaphor. 
that cough syrup does not cure pneumonia. As a medical doctor, I can tell you that. But many people with pneumonia have a prominent symptom of cough. If we see these various expressions as a problem and not the symptom, then we will often respond with interventions that do not get to the heart of the matter. Whereas if we see them of a symptom, as a symptom of a larger need, then we will look deeper. And so uh, while I want to reduce antipsychotics to the rare exception and not the rule, you don't start there. And I think even setting reducing distress as our primary goal is wrong because once again, uh, that is the cough, it's not the pneumonia. I believe our primary goal is to create well-being. And, and um, I'll, I'll just correct one thing John said. He talked about the seven domains of well-being. This is a model of seven domains of well-being, and I certainly don't want to force my model on anybody. There are many out there. Kip Wood has one, and Mike Nolan has one, and Manfred Max Neef, the economist, has one, and they're all very valid. Um, I just chose one that I had worked with, helped uh, develop a measurement tool for through some culture change specialists in the U.S., and I just like this because it's fairly comprehensive to me. It's easy for me to understand, easy for me to teach. Um, and so I use these seven domains, identity, connectedness, security, autonomy, meaning, growth, and joy. And uh, once again, I'm, I'm just using the example of wandering, which I put in quotes because I don't like the word. It's labeling. It suggests purposeless activity. Um, but often when people are wandering in a care home or even in their own home or saying, I want to go home, we are trying to figure out what they're looking for. And they might be looking for something, but it's often not a specific house or a specific place. They're often looking for what's on the slide here, places where they feel emotionally safe, where they have choice and control, where the activity presented to them is meaningful, where there's important relationships. And what we do is we alarm doors and put circular courtyards in and put pictures on elevators so they don't look like elevators. And we keep people safe, but the wandering doesn't stop, does it? Because we didn't give them what they were really looking for. Now at the greenhouse homes, a small house model I helped open in St. John's, we had people moving out to these houses about 20 kilometers from St. John's, 10 people in each house. And even though they're beautiful houses and we had the best staff you can imagine, you can imagine some of the people who moved out there who were living with dementia would try to leave. They were uh, confused by the move, didn't know anybody. But during those several weeks, we had dedicated staff who were getting to know people, understanding their needs, their rhythms, and also working on these seven domains of well-being. And after several weeks, they had a team meeting because the noise of the alarms being set off by people's wander bracelets uh, was disturbing to the tranquility of the houses. And they looked critically at the pattern of the alarms going off and they realized something amazing. And that was the people were walking with their bracelets too close to the sensors, but they weren't trying to leave anymore. The sensors have about a uh, two or three meter radius. And so what they did after taking a deep breath and taking on their own measure of trust was they cut off the bracelets. And now for three years, those greenhouse homes do not have anybody wearing alarm bracelets because people are not trying to leave anymore. So once again, we expect that these things are inevitable because people have dementia, but how much is it really the lack of well-being that leads into this? We'll cure sundowning a little bit later if we have time. Um, I put these in a sort of a Maslow type hierarchy because I personally believe that there's a way to help enhance well-being in people with change in cognition. I believe if you don't know the person and have a meaningful relationship, you can't help them at all. So I put those at the bottom of the pyramid. I don't put security at the bottom uh, like Maslow does with safety because security is more than physical safety. It's emotional security, trust, familiarity, respect, dignity, balance, all those things. Um, and I might mention that although all the models of well-being I talked about are substituted judgment, there is a group in Canada, the Murray Alzheimer's Research and Education Program, who looked at important leisure experiences and asked 200 people living with dementia in the U.S. and Canada to talk about what made those experiences important. And they were able to funnel the answers into seven categories, which I have listed up there. Being me, being with, seeking freedom, finding balance, making a difference, growing, developing, and having fun. I got excited about this because with a little switching of the order, you can line these up with those seven domains of well-being. So I feel like people living with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia have actually given us some validation that, yes, just because I have been diagnosed with this condition doesn't mean that these domains of well-being are no longer important. In some cases, uh, for example, autonomy and meaning, you might suggest that they take on uh, even magnified importance because there's something we take for granted and are so quickly lost when you have the diagnosis. 
Now, I, uh, there are a couple things unique about my book. First of all, it's uh, written by a guy with a medical doctor degree. Uh, thanks to Dr. Shibley Raman. We have a couple out there, but I think when my book came out, it might have been the first one written by a medical doctor specifically talking about, and I'll use the phrase person-centered, although I, I don't use that often, um, uh, approaches to dementia. Uh, but the other thing that was unique about my book is that I have worked in the culture change field for a long time. And I realize it's not enough to think differently about dementia. We have to transform the living environment. Um, and so that's why I bring this into my books. Uh, no matter what philosophy of care you embrace, if you bring it into an institution, it will die on the vine every time. You need a pathway to operationalize new philosophies, to ingrain them into daily processes. And that's what culture change is. And it can happen in a care home, and it can also happen in your own house or apartment. So this is the big, big secret, why non-pharmacological interventions don't work. And I went down this road. I was in meetings with people at the care homes, trying to come up with a laundry list of things to do, which often included laundry, as a matter of fact. Uh, and they would often wear off. And I realized that the typical intervention is still looking at what we call person-centered care with a biomedical mindset. It's just not enough paradigm shift. It tends to be reactive, not proactive. We often have a list of discrete activities that we choose. They may not have much meaning for the person. There may even be no consideration of the person in a relational or historical context. It's not tied into well-being. It's often treated like doses of pills, you know, fold laundry, Q day, uh, and superimposed on the usual care environment. Well, that won't help people. And I finally figured this out a couple of years ago when I went to Iowa, a rural section of the U.S., and heard about a gentleman who kept going out the back door and would be frustrated when people would redirect him. And finally, uh, the manager suggested they let him go once and watch him. And he walked to the back fence where there was a cow pasture and watched the cows for about 15 minutes. It came in and sat down and was very calm the rest of the day. Well, it turned out when they talked to his family that he had been a dairy farmer and he always started his day by checking on the cows. He could see the cows out the window and was repeating a pattern related to his history and his identity. Well, I don't mention this because it's a clever way of figuring somebody out. I mention it because what do we do when someone tries to exit a care home? We have them try some music therapy or maybe aromatherapy or, or maybe have them fold laundry, but what if they need to check the cows? If we don't understand that, none of our interventions will work. And that also explains why research on non-pharmacological interventions often falls short because they're presented as a blanket intervention of the researchers choosing in a very generic way without any understanding of the person's needs. So it's not shocking that we don't have better data. Um, when I talk about transforming a living environment, I talk about not only changing our, our uh, philosophy, but uh, structural components. And most importantly, I think operational components as well. So physically, you want a living environment that supports the values of home and domains of well-being. But even your own house uh, can be a place where you can be distressed. So we also have to talk about all those other things that happen during the day, how decisions are made, how we empower, how we resolve conflict, how we partner in care. And in formal care settings, it even comes to things like job descriptions. Because as the American author Upton Sinclair said, it's hard to get a man to understand something if his paycheck depends on his not understanding. Remember that your own home can be as institutional as any care home you've ever seen. If you also have the stigma, the lack of family support, education, lack of community or financial support, if you have caregiver stress and burnout, and I've used caregiver because that word to me uh, suggests a one-way street, and uh, if the person sees themselves as the person that has to act for two, as Christine Brides, Bryden says, that can lead to both burnout on their part and excess disability on the part of the person with the diagnosis. If the person's unable to flex rhythms to meet the person's needs, they're the only one at home, so they have to sleep uh, at night, and so the person gets a sleeping pill. If there's social isolation and over-medication, then this is an institution, then it often hastens decline and placement into formal living settings. And lastly, culture changes for everyone. It's not just up to care homes to change what they do, it's up to everybody to shift and there are some negative messages from regulators, negative messages from auditors, liability insurers, reimbursement mechanisms that perpetuate the wrong model of care. Everybody has to shift. So a well-being approach can be used for both ongoing support and care. It can be part of an ongoing care plan, well-being plan, but it can also be used for decoding distress. And I won't go into this in detail, but in my second book I have in Chapter 10 a detailed um, explanation of how I use a well-being approach in my seminars to take a real-life challenging scenario and uh, 
help people think about it in a way they've never been taught to think about it before. You see, the problem with well-being as a focus is that none of us in any of our professions is ever taught about this. We're taught how to check blood pressures and assess people with a fever and change dressings and give a bath. We're never taught about how to create autonomy or growth or meaning. And as a result, I believe that most of the distress we see that isn't easily figured out comes from erosion of domains of well-being. And if we're never taught how to approach these in a proactive way, that's why we get stuck and say, quote, we've tried everything, when in fact we've tried almost nothing. And that's what these uh, seminars that I describe in my book actually often show. I'll just give you a few examples of ways to uh, operationalize some of these domains because they're kind of fuzzy. You might think that they don't have any hard-edged practice uh, components, but let me just spend five or 10 minutes finishing up with this and uh, then I'd love to have lots of time for discussion. I can give more examples if we need, but I want to not shortchange the people on the call because I know we have quite a few. So I said we cure sundowning. Well, I didn't do it myself. It was actually my friend Tina Alonzo and their group at the Beatitudes campus in Phoenix, Arizona, who realized that there were a couple of things going on in their care home. Uh, this is a gentleman in the St. John's Greenhouse, who I'll talk about in a moment too. Um, but. Uh, what they realized were there were two things happening that led to this late day uh, anxiety or uh, restlessness, which I view as aspects of identity. So I put it in the identity chapter. One is that people were causing a lot of commotion at the change of shift, particularly in the late afternoon, and they're putting on coats and saying good night, and I'm going to pick up my kids, and I'll see you tomorrow, and, and triggering people's past identity and making people wonder, do I need to go somewhere? Should I check on my family? Uh, and causing some anxiety. The other thing was that they were forcing people into their rhythms of activity, of waking and sleeping, and it didn't necessarily fit the changing rhythms of the individuals who were living with cognitive change, with brain changes. So they did two simple operational changes. Number one, no change of commo no co commotion, excuse me, a change of shift. People would put on their coats, leave silently by another door, no big production in front of people when they were leaving. The second thing was simple, rest is needed. If people seemed frazzled, they could lie down and rest. It didn't matter how well they slept the night before or whether they were uh, expected in an activity or at a meal, we followed their rhythm and not the rhythm uh, of the organization. And in doing those things, the Beatitude Campus has virtually eliminated sundowning for 15 years straight. So once again, another symptom that is called uh, a symptom of dementia a symptom of brain disease, inevitable, uh, is not necessarily the case. Connecting this, let me uh, give a shout out to Australia and our care, age care. My friend Dan Greenwood, who's the strategy and innovation manager down there, who has uh, spoken extensively, including ADI, about their dedicated staff assignment uh, um, initiative. And uh, there's a YouTube link there for a wonderful video that Kath, Kathy Greenblatt made, a 15 minute video uh, profile in their home, Helensvale, which is an integrated home, people with and without dementia living together. One of the first ones to embrace this dedicated staff uh, process. Now you can call this consistent assignments, permanent assignments. I prefer the word dedicated because it suggests actually that people have a, a relationship, that they have an intent to work with these people, not that they've just been randomly assigned. But very quickly, as Dan presented, for those who were at Perth, uh, there are now getting close to two dozen or 25 uh, care communities in South and East Australia. They have some separate living areas and some that are integrated. Um, but in an appreciative inquiry survey of 80 elders, family, and staff, how do we take our care to the next level? Four main categories were identified, and the big one was connections, comments about relationships. And, and uh, Daniela and her team began to formulate a pathway for dedicated staff assignments in all areas where people live with the diagnosis of dementia. They had education sessions, they had reapplication sessions, they looked at people to decide who are the best people to work in these areas, uh, got positive feedback, and these early homes that started this two years ago, within six weeks, the staff were spending more time with the elders without sacrificing test completion, and this early adopted community had a nearly 70% decrease in chest infections, well, why would that happen? Well, look down at the bottom there. The average day evening care partners in a month went from 26 to four or five. When you have that many fewer people touching you, coughing on you, sneezing on you, you can imagine why people get uh, infected less often. The almost complete elimination of uh, pressure injuries, 100% decrease in formal complaints from families. Uh, and I can just go down the road. I won't spend time on this, but you can see all the results that they've reported from their early adopting homes and now spreading throughout their community. 
um, pretty amazing when you think about what you can do simply by changing our operations. So while relationships sound fuzzy, staffing assignments are not fuzzy at all, and these data are not fuzzy at all. Um, here are a couple studies from the U.S. Thousands of U.S. nursing homes. The second one was almost a quarter of all care homes in the U.S. showed significantly uh, significant improvements in quality of care, quality of life, fewer uh, deficiencies from sur surveyors, audits, uh, and significantly lower turnover and absenteeism from hands-on care partners. And two studies of so-called aggressive behavior, I don't use the word anymore because I think it's labeling, but, but that's what the studies called it, and they found a major factor in both cases was a decreased consistency and quality of staff out of relationships, leading to people more likely to strike out uh, during care. Uh, in my book, I get on my soapbox, my latest book, and I really say that I believe it's the standard of care, that dedicated staff assignments should be considered the standard of care, and it's no longer acceptable to avoid doing this. Uh, I have many other examples that are uh, particularly in my newest book, talking about how we can use the transformational processes of culture change to enhance these domains of well-being in all living environments, whether it be your home or a care home. Simple things like knocking on someone's room in a care home, identifying yourself, asking permission to walk in the door, giving the person one space that they own, that they control in this communal living setting so that they can have more security. I talk about the double-edged swords of alarms, about how um, we think alarms keep people safe, but the noise, the idea of having alarms going off actually erodes people's security. A locked door and people that may worry about things like safety and fire risk can actually increase people's sense of insecurity. So the things that make sense to us don't always make sense to the person living with the diagnosis. Um, continual consent, something else I got from Dan Greenwood. The idea that autonomy is not just, would you like a shower now, but checking in, getting input, and participation through every step of a process. And we can go right down the line. There are many, many more things that we could talk about if we had time. Um, I'm going to leave you with it quote, because in our country, the only hope we, we peddle is the hope that if we just give enough money to the drug researchers, we'll have a cure. Um, there are many good articles out there that explain why absolutely eradicating dementia from our world uh, is a, a very difficult road to hoe to uh, say it most mildly. I don't personally believe that if we're going to live to be 80 or 90, there will ever be a day when people don't forget more than we think is normal. Um, so I peddle a different kind of hope. I don't consider myself a pessimist but actually an optimist. I believe, as Vaclav Havel said, that hope is not a prognostication, it's an orientation of the spirit. It's not the same thing as optimism, not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. And as he finished his quote, life is too precious a thing to permit its devaluation by living pointlessly, emptily, without meaning, without love, and finally without hope. And I would close my talk by saying, that no matter what we do with our advances in drug research, those seven domains of well-being will never come in a pill bottle. And if we're not working on those, which we can do right this moment without having a new drug available, we need to work on those every day. If we don't, any pill that comes down the road is not going to help us. And I'm going to uh, skip the story at the end there and just go to a couple things here. Uh, they wanted me to put on some things about where my books are available. Uh, both my books, uh, the new one on top, old one on the bottom, are available in book and ebook. Uh, the new one's a sequel, but you can read them in whatever order you want. Uh, they do not repeat each other more than very minimally. Uh, I don't want you to pay money for the same thing over again like some authors do. Um, and you can get them from Amazon here, Amazon UK, Footprint Books is the distributor in Australia, uh, Health Professions Press is the publisher. I've made a couple, co-produced a couple of videos with um, Richard Taylor, Dr. Richard Taylor, and with Julius uh, Kea from Brilliant Image Productions. Uh, his quote, Richard's quote was from 20 questions, 100 answers, six perspectives with Richard, me, Dr. Bill Thomas, Eden Alternative founder, Sarah Rowan, a board member, um, Judy Berry from Lakeview Ranch Homes in Minnesota, Mona Johnson, a, a journalist. Um, and then Living with Dementia is just a, a copy of a talk that Richard and I gave in Minnesota at a college. I spoke for an hour, he spoke for an hour, and then we had about an hour and a half of question and answer with both of us at the front of the room. And those are available either from the modestly titled website, bestdementiavideosandbooks.com, or from uh, my publisher as well, uh, if you're looking for any of those. I don't know anything about the PAL format or how well they work, but they should play on your laptop, if not on your DVD players. So I'm gonna leave things there because uh, we still have lots of time. The webinar can be technically open, 
until uh, oh, another 39 minutes by my calculation. I think um, uh, what I'd like to do rather than talk more, I can talk a lot more as you might have guessed, but I would like to see what the chat box looks like, hear what people are thinking, get some input from our two experts on the call and uh, hear what you have to say. So thank you very much and I'll minimize this and uh, pass the screen back or do whatever you'd like me to do with the screen, John. Yeah, if you hit uh, stop screen share, it'll just go back to, uh, if, if people have it in speaker view, then they have the person speaking large, and yep. um, there's an option up in the upper right. You can put it in gallery view, and then you see a whole bunch of boxes of video. So either way, people want to do it. Um, I do want to say that I am going to unmute everyone, but I have to say, please, 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 if you have background noise, dog barking, phone ringing, any kind of noise, it's really disruptive to everyone else, so it's important for you to mute yourself. And there's a lot of people here, so if, if we get tons of noise, then I'll have to mute everyone with the option of people unmuting themselves when they want to talk. So, but uh, right now you're, you're locked out, so I'm going to unmute everyone, and, and hopefully people can mute if they've got any noise going on around them. And really appreciate your presentation, um, Al, Dr. Power. Um, those are great. And uh, someone did ask about whether they were able to get a copy of your slides. Kate had said, if you agreed to it, we could always put them on our website, but that's totally up to you. Yeah, I sent a PDF with three slides per page and room for yeah. notes. And if you'd like to post that version, that would be great. Okay. Kate, you can handle that. Yep. Okay. Thank, thanks, Al. Fantastic. No and I would also mention uh, with the unmuting, if somebody starts a question, and, uh, even though if you have a burning question, if you just mute yourself till that person's done, then unmute again. It just, uh, the echoes and everything can be pretty crazy. We have over 100 people on the call. So I would agree. Yeah. With you. Right, just right, be right. Conscious of what's going on in your own environment as you talk. Right, and it's so hard to, to uh, or it's so easy to forget that the noises around you are going out over your microphone. A lot of times people don't even realize that. So with that, I'm gonna unmute all, see how it works, and I may have to mute all, but it'll be with the option that you can unmute yourself. So here we go. There's some random noises that are bringing screens up, but I don't hear anything that sounds like a question yet. Speak up. Here's what we'll do. Okay, listen, I just muted everybody, but you have the option to unmute yourself. So if you want to ask a question, please just go down to your microphone icon, unmute yourself, and then ask a question. Um, here, I'll... I see Maxanne's picture up there. I think she has something that she'd like to ask. If so, yeah. unmute yourself, please. Max, I'll see if I can find you here, Max. He's wearing a nice coral-colored blouse there, glasses, blonde hair. There, I think yeah. I can. There it is. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Um, I, I just have a, a I have FTD, and, and one thing that frustrates frustrates me when we've been looking at assisted livings and things is that dementia is is treated all the same and sorry we got you're freezing maxanne but let me let me take what you've done so far you've said that you're frustrated when looking at various uh assisted living communities because dementia is treated all the same and as a person with frontotemporal diagnosis it bothers you, I assume, that people just assume that everybody is alike. Um, is, is that a reasonable? You're still frozen on my screen. Let me talk, and if you unfreeze, then uh, you can add to that if you like. But you've certainly said enough to trigger some thoughts in my head, and uh, I feel your frustration. Okay, was that, was, did that capture you, Maxana, or is there more you want to say about that? No, that, that, that's right. I just feel... 
Uh, still freezing. I, mean, I think there's these are different than those with Alzheimer's, but yeah, what that means that, is, that's right. What that means is your bandwidth is low. So if anybody finds that happening, it means uh, close all other windows, internet, you know, email, Facebook, because they're taking away your your strength. Um, anyway, um, uh, to respond to that, um, I agree a hundred percent. I think that uh, one of the problems with this uh, with this syndrome that we're calling dementia is that we do tend to make wholesale judgments about people based on this label. And I think that's very dangerous. One of the things I do in my seminar, and not everybody agrees with this, but I do not spend much time at all, if any, talking about the difference between dementia and what they're like. And I do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, you can get that information from professional associations. You don't need to fly me into your country to talk about the difference between Alzheimer's or, or um, Lewy body. But, but there's a more important reason, and that is that I do believe that we tend to pigeonhole and stereotype based on these views of what people have. So there are two problems. The one you mentioned that we think everybody with dementia is alike, but we also have a problem where we think everybody with FTD is alike and everybody with Alzheimer's right. is alike. And so uh, those of you who have read my books and heard me speak know that first of all, I am not a proponent of segregating people with any diagnosis of dementia in living areas. I believe everybody should live together. And I believe that we should not look at your type of dementia. We should look at who you are as an individual. Um, and I've tried to come up with an approach that people can use that way because if I'm a busy nursing assistant or professional support worker, as they say in Canada, and I am with somebody who is distressed, I shouldn't have to stop my work and step back and say, oh my goodness, does this person have Alzheimer's, FTD, Lewy body? How should I help her? I believe that there are some basic universal needs that apply to everybody. And it's more important to know who Maxanne is as, a, as an individual, I think than to know what her label is. That's my personal feeling. But I'd love I, to I agree. Thank you. Dr. Power? Yes. Yes, hi, my name is Michelle. Dr. Power, I'm an occupational therapist by background. And I wanted to know, I, I so appreciate what you said about um, getting to know the people that are in our care. And I use occupational profiles. I I got the occupational profiles and then you froze. Hang on, let's see if we can get you back. Michelle, if you got any other open uh, windows, close them. I, I, you froze after using occupational profiles. Okay, you, okay, you're back live again. Okay, and I just wanted to know, do you have any recommendations for any profiles or any um, data gathering that you use to get to know your clients, to know their values and their interests and their needs? You know, you're not the first person asking me that question, and I think I, I may have to come up with one. I think there are probably some out there. I think uh, if you're from the U.S., if you go to the Pioneer Network website, they may have some resources. I know the Eden Alternative has some ways of getting to know people, but I think that we really need to, and, and maybe Kate or John or some other people know about this, but I have not seen personally what I think are really great comprehensive tools. There are medical and functional things we need to know about people, but there are also many other things that our standard assessments don't tell us. And I think a really good comprehensive who am I type thing has not quite been done to my satisfaction. So I am putting out the uh, RFP, I guess. <laughs> or maybe you're the one to do it, Michelle. I don't know. Where are you, where are you based, by the way? <laughs> Thank you. Where, where are you based? I'm, I'm based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, wonderful. Okay, great. Well, hopefully we'll get to meet one of these days and maybe we can work on something like that. Yeah, Al, I might add to that, Al. Yes, um, thanks, Kate. Th there's a number of uh, organizations around the world who've got, you know, tools similar to life story work. Um, but what happens in the care setting that I've seen, and I've worked in dementia care settings, is they end up as a one-pager in the front of the case notes. Yeah. And they get put there and they're never referred to ever again. Mm. So um, they don't seem to work in the practical level. They sound fantastic as an idea, but, but in the real terms, in the real world, they don't really work because staff don't seem to use them. Mm. So this points up again, Kate, why uh, culture change is both uh, philosoph 
philosophical, but also operational. Um, Absolutely. Number one, it's one thing to collect information. It's another thing to put it somewhere where nobody sees it. Um, right. And yeah. I know certain countries have rules and regulations. Oh, doctors can write here, but social workers can't mm -hmm. and that type of thing. And uh, to me, that's kind of ridiculous because that's important information. And I think you, you alluded to the other thing that I was, I was sort of implying with Michelle, and that is I'm not saying I've not seen tools. I've seen tools, but uh, they're never quite adequate. A lot of them are who, who I've been in the past. They don't talk about who I am today. And we know as people get older, and I've seen this as a person without a diagnosis, as my abilities change, my priorities may change. Um, and so I may not uh, want to be approached like I would have wanted to be approached 30 years ago. And it's important to understand who the person is evolving to be, not just uh, who the family remembers from 30 years ago and wants to tell you about. And so it's important to know, I'll give you the Sam Fazio quote as best I can remember uh, from the U.S. Alzheimer's Association. I put in my book, uh, it's, he basically says, I'm almost paraphrasing here, it's important to know who the person was, who they are today, and who they're becoming. Um, uh, the past, uh, I'm sorry, the past must be allowed to um, influence the present, yet not to define it. Uh, mm -hmm. The present must also be allowed to influence itself. And the past and present must be allowed to influence the future, but the future must also be left free to influence itself. So it's a sort of confusing way of saying we are all evolving individuals. And I think too many of those life histories concentrate on past and don't necessarily understand who the person is today and what they need to create a new identity in their new living environment, not just the one they used to have. Excellent. Thank you. I have a suggestion. Yes. Um, I am familiar with person within person centered planning for individuals with developmental disabilities they have personal pages and that if it sounds like maybe there's a mistake in thinking that there is a document that can be completed and filled out and done like a you know like a piece of a chart and instead of, if there could be a personal page that the person contributes to and that they add to and they add new pictures to or add new quotes to or different things about who they are and what they're up to now so yeah. this month they might like going out on walks by the river or looking at flowers or something that might be different than it would be anyway yeah. so if it could be a dynamic document like that mm -hmm. that the individual participated in that might be helpful thanks anna that's a, that's a really wise uh, mm -hmm. statement that you've made and and um it's really true and, and 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 that's why at least in care homes when i talk about using well-being actually in the care plans these things are reviewed four times a year why not have identity and connectedness and security in there and say what are we doing today for this person's identity what is this person's need what are, their, what are their ways of expressing themselves? And the other thing that you allude to, uh, that's, that's another way we pathologize people, is we think everything is, is a behavior when somebody might just want some spontaneity. Maybe they want to do something that, you, that they didn't do the last three days in a row. Uh, maybe they want to have some aesthetic enjoyment. Maybe they want to express some agency. That's not a behavior. That's, that's something we're labeling because we see that diagnosis. We don't see the person. And, and what you're describing leaves the person open to discover themselves every day. And I think that's a wonderful insight. Thanks. Yeah. Love that. Alan, uh, on, on a personal note for me, this John, um, I, I love that you talk about the use of antipsychotics because this has always been a big issue to me. And, and, a, and I didn't have statistics prior to seeing yours but i always had the feeling that they were overused drastically when they could when they probably should hardly ever be used and and i appreciate you shining a spotlight on that more because that's something that really needs to change yeah thanks john while you're saying that because there's some bandwidth issues i'm just kind of looking along, uh, if I can just mention a couple of things, Mary Compton works with Relish Solutions. I found we don't ask why about the info we gathered. Uh, so she presents routinely on that concept. Uh, we have somebody who works with Keep a Snow's Positive Approach, and she yes. has a comprehensive form, which, uh, which she wants to mention, which I will mention to you too. I know Tipa well, and she uh, travels uh, the country and sometimes elsewhere uh, sharing her philosophy and her practices, her hands-on communication practices, which are valuable. Um, uh, there was another one I wanted to mention. Um, 
uh, Richard Taylor, uh, who's always got a good thing to say. Uh, Hello, Richard says, setting the bar on one person not only shows they're ignorant, but they're ignorant of their ignorance. Why else would they embarrass themselves by asking for one person to re represent 12 million human beings? That's kind of what I blogged about recently. Um, the World Dementia Council uh, believe one person with dementia on the committee can represent 45 million. Um, had a private communication saying they'd love to see me in Texas, and I will be in Texas, August 20th, uh, in Austin, and I will be uh, doing a five-city tour, uh, more uh, clinically oriented towards nurses and care professionals, uh, which will also stop in Dallas, both and Arlington and also uh, Abilene in November, December. So check my website, lpower.net, if anyone in Texas wants to see me. I'll also be doing my two-day Dementia Beyond Drug seminar in Texas next year, end of March, beginning of April, a session in Dallas and a session in Austin. Uh, I believe Austin is March 30th and 31st, and uh, Dallas is April 4th and 5th. So Texas is going to be seeing a lot of me because you score very high in antipsychotics, and CMS is paying me to come down and talk to you all about that. Just like all the other CMS grants I've gotten in the U.S. have been some of the highest scoring states. So, um, so yes, uh, for those of you in Texas saying when and where, uh, go to lpower.net, go to my schedule, and you will see the places uh, that I'm doing this year. Uh, the other place in Dallas next year will be April 4th and 5th, my two-day Dementia Beyond Dr Drugs seminar presented in conjunction with the Eden Alternative. It's a 15-hour intensive, but lots of fun way of looking at well-being. Uh, and it will be a CMS grant, which will give uh, employees of care homes and surveyors and ombudsmen the opportunity to go for free. Two or three from every home, every surveyor in the area, and probably ombudsmen as well. Uh, so if you work for a professional, a nursing home, a care home, uh, you may actually be able to attend the course for free. Uh, so. Definitely keep an eye on the Eden Alternative website, edenalt.org, if you want to hear about those trainings uh, next year. They will also be in some other hot-button states, Kansas, Illinois, Georgia, and South Carolina, starting in January of that year. Um, so there we go. Kate, enjoy Lake Como. I'm, I give you credit for having been on as long as you were, and um, so uh, enjoy yourself and stop worrying about us and have a great time tonight. Uh, okay. Thanks so much, Al. Bye, all. Bye, Kate. Uh, other questions, comments? Yes, Dr. Power, I have a, a comment. My name's Carol Mulliken, and I live in Missouri. I was diagnosed nearly 15 years ago with dementia, and I love your changing the culture of care idea. But the reality is for many, many people, they are being cared for at home, and there is a culture at home as well. I hope caregivers will demand better training. Yeah. yeah. Be active. Thanks a lot for your point. I think it's a great point. And once again, uh, that's why I wanted to make those points earlier in the talk that number one, your home can be an institution. Mm -hmm. And number two, antipsychotic overuse is probably more prevalent in the home than it is in nursing homes. And to be fair to family members, they've got a tough job. They have to be not only the spouse or son or daughter, but the doctor, nurse, mm -hmm. aide, uh, social worker, psychologist. And, and they need to be there 24 seven. And if you have somebody who wants to be awake at 1 a.m., uh, that may not work for the person that needs the energy, maybe the 80-year-old spouse who's got to support that person. So it becomes a really difficult thing. And in our country, at least, it is very difficult to get much care in the home, professional care, without, unless you're independently wealthy. So we have a system that's broken, uh, it, and, but we need, need to educate. And this is where I think we have failed, is that we're not giving enough positive well-being-focused education to family carers or to home health agencies as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, one other comment that was made that I think was an excellent comment. I do want to talk about that. Um, the question about the sundowning intervention of Beatitudes. Wanted to know if a person starts in a loop of speech, confusion, et cetera, are they expressing uh, a need for rest? Well, Beatitudes found they often were. I'm not saying that that's the only reason why a person may be distressed, but it may show that they are just getting to that point. I tell people I make them sundown in my seminars. I take people mm -hmm. to work from 7 to 3.30 or midnight to 7, and, and I, um, I uh, put them in a seminar that's set up at 8 to 5 because that's when it's convenient for me. And these people who are on their feet working all day are asked to sit most of the day, and guess what happens at 2 or 3 in the afternoon? They start getting restless and looking at their texts and stretching and walking around. And, and is it sundowning or have I forced them into an unnatural rhythm? So I think the more we can understand what the person's rhythm is and find ways to shift our once again, shift our patterns of care and support 
to meet those rhythms as much as possible better. Now, once again, that's the culture change message. If somebody wants to be awake at 2 a.m., your staffing pattern may not be uh, perfectly set so that that can be accommodated. So until you start to create cross-functional, empowered teams of people who are um, – who are able to start to make these shifts, then um, we're uh, gonna get in trouble. Now, someone says that my domain has expired. Well, I hope that's not true because I was just on there the other day. I'm gonna look at this while I am uh, talking to all of you to see if something happened here to my website. Hmm, I need to talk to my host because uh, it's not expired. Uh, my pay should my my thing should be paid up. So either my web guy is playing with it or uh, something happened. But I will get on that with you. Uh, you also have my email address there if you want to email me for specific dates and things. Absolutely. Also got a message from Kim McRae, the Dementia Action Alliance in the U.S. has sent out a survey. Um, I didn't put it up here just because it is uh, the survey said it was looking for people in the U.S. and I knew this was very international. But if you go to the Dementia Action Alliance, you can Google them. They are surveying both people living with the diagnosis and their uh, informal uh, support network, family members, friends, to fill out a survey about their needs. Uh, I wish uh, you would all take a look at that too. That's really important. And uh, thank you so much for looking at my website and pointing this out because I will get on that right away. Hopefully by the end of the week, lpower.net will be back up and running for whatever reason. Maybe they think I didn't pay a bill, but I'll figure it out. Um, somebody else. Anybody else? We still got a little time, I believe. Yes, this is Barbara. Yes, Barbara. Um, what we're seeing, uh, I'm in Louisiana, and what we're seeing is nursing homes uh, trying to implement new interventions, uh, adopting the, the new uh, guidelines, and so forth. But the, one of the barriers are the physicians not being willing or open-minded to reducing or to discontinuing the antipsychotic. Do you have some specific recommendations on how to change the minds of MD? Uh, yeah, I think the best way to do it, first of all, there are a couple of things I can recommend. Number one, the uh, professional practice associations, both the American Geriatric Society and the Medical Directors Association, have come down with fairly strong statements about antipsychotics. So uh, we can refer the doctors to the representation, the, to the, I'm sorry, to the organizations that represent them uh, for some guidance. Also, if you have a medical director who is on board, that medical director can kind of act as the, the linchpin mm -hmm. to help other doctors on staff too. Mm -hmm. and the, as I would say, lean on the nurses. Doctors don't listen to a lot of people, but if they listen to anyone, it's probably the nurse or maybe consulting psychologists, if you can get them in your camp and use them as your advocates, that would be helpful. The last thing I would say is that really the best approach, I think, is to find ways to care for people and to do it and to show how you can improve people's well-being. Um, the reason I wrote my books, not for doctors, but really for, um, for uh, my core audience was really uh, people that do hands-on care, particularly professional staff is uh, not that I don't want doctors to read them, but doctors do read it and find the books helpful. But as the core audience, I, I believe that you have the most uh, power to create change. Most doctors uh, are giving antipsychotics because they're being called by staff saying, so-and-so is out of control, we need something. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we have that you don't is a license to prescribe. So if someone calls us, we're basically being told implicitly, we want a pill. So it, when I've talked to people that use little or no medication, and Beatitudes run zero to two percent with their antipsychotics, um, I work with other organizations and myself. I've been way down in that range with antipsychotic use. When I ask the organizations, how do you get the doctors on board? They all tell me the same thing, and that is the doctors look to us. If we can show that we have better ways of caring for people and that they're not distressed all the time, then doctors aren't going to force pills on us. But if we're calling them, asking for help, their paradigm is such that that's what they're gonna give us. So I think that really, those of you who work in care homes are the leaders. You can influence the doctors by your actions as much as anything. And I know there are doctors out there that are clueless. I just heard about a doctor in Oklahoma that sent somebody back from the hospital with a hip fracture with no pain medication because, quote, Alzheimer's patients don't feel pain. Um, so there are some idiots out there, I'm afraid to say, but um, I do believe that we can slowly start to influence people through our actions. Uh, hello. Uh, Hi. Susan. Yes. Uh, Susan, I'm uh, from Canada and I have um, 
PCA, which I had to wrestle with the diagnosis to get it myself because I knew I didn't have Alzheimer's at that point. And I am um, doing some work myself. Um, I'm very interested about independence. I am the rational and how much uh, that is behind what happens. And I'm working a lot with what, what is independence. First thing that happens is you, you're said, here's your fair caregiver. Well, my husband it's pretty hard for him. That throws the whole family in to say they have to do things they may not be able to do. And I think that's wrong. I, I don't have a caregiver. I always go, even if I get a bad time by myself, I hand them, you know. Um, and the more I get into independence, the more I am just amazed at the innovation, the, um, that people with dementia and, and PCAs do themselves just to live every day. And if most of the people around them did, had to do as much of that uh, thinking and being changing and, and, and um, being inventive, <laughs> they'd probably be better off. And I think um, that's not recognized. We don't need people to do everything. In fact, what we want is people to do the least possible, in my mind. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know that uh, the folks up in Waterloo uh, like to say nothing about me without me. And that's also the name of Christine Bryden's new book. Yeah. Which is coming out. Um, uh, the folks at our care like to say uh, the least that I can do, the most that you can do, speaking to the person with the diagnosis. Uh, and so I think I think you raised some really good points. First of all, I think that the need to be involved in daily life is critical and is something we're very quick to take away from people. I believe that regardless of your abilities, there's always a way that you can have input into a process, even if you have trouble with language or other aspects. And the other important point that you bring up is that people's brains are not gone. They are working to compensate for what's not working well. As Christine Bryden would say, parts of my brain are not working well, but I'm teaching other parts of my brain to do things. Mm -hmm. And so a person who may sound what we call delusional, I, I tend to resist those those types of words, because I believe that that person's brain is actually working very hard to make sense of a world where there are some broken connections and all the information is available. Mm -hmm. And I liken it to the U.S. game Wheel of Fortune, where they put a, it's like hangman, they put a phrase up on the board with the letters missing, and you gradually fill in the phrase, and as you have a few letters, you might guess something that's wrong or totally bizarre, because you don't have enough information about what the real phrase is. And I think when you have difficulty with memory and word finding, then your brain goes to a different kind of problem solving. Mm -hmm. Or it may solve things on more of an emotional or more of a symbolic level than a factual or cognitive level. And if we don't appreciate that, then we don't understand that the person is actually processing things mm -hmm. in a different way that works for them. And when we understand that, and this actually relates to the story I was going to tell, so maybe I'll, I'll close with that today uh, as a little communication tip I got. Um, but I, I think that's a very important part. And, and the other thing that um, my friend Dan Greenwood from Australia brought to me that, that I'm just learning about is the idea of relational autonomy, that even choice and control are relation, uh, relational. Uh, there's no, that we're not truly independent, we're all interdependent. And I think this, this idea that I have to decide for you or that you have to do it all by yourself is kind of a misnomer. We always make decisions. So if I go to a doctor that knows more about a condition than I do, mm -hmm. um, I might defer some of those decisions to that person because he or she uh, may have important input. So I'm not saying I have to absolutely make this all by myself. We need to work together. And Christine Bryden talks about care partnerships where the person with dementia and those around the person that form a, a supportive partnership. Uh, Christine said that she believes many people are making an important journey from this idea of pure higher cognition into levels that are more driven by emotional and symbolic representations of the world, which are more durable memories. And Richard Taylor made a similar comment on the slide I skipped about how if I call you mom or dad, I may actually be thinking more about the feelings I associate with mom and dad. Um, and what I learned from that is that instead of when someone says, uh, have you seen my mother, instead of either you know being stuck in that paradigm of do we tell the truth and upset them or do we lie and have that blow up in our face, that they may be expressing a different need. They may be expressing a symbolic need rather than just the, the pure fact of having mm -hmm. seen this individual who may have died years ago. And, and I was using this in Alaska and actually helped a woman up there solve a, a challenge she had with her mother who was asking her every night after her visit, um, where are you going to sleep when she said good night? 
And her daughter was saying, well, I'm going to sleep in my bed, of course. I'm going home. And that triggered tears. And her mother wanted to go home and missing her husband and her house. And the woman was about to cut down her visits. And when she heard me talk about this, she said, okay, maybe I'm stuck too much on the words the way I think about it. What else might she be saying to me? Because she has trouble with words. And what she decided after my talk was the woman was saying, I'm your mother. I care about your safety, your well-being, your happiness. And that night, she took her mother back to her room. And when she said good night, and her mother said, where are you going to sleep? She said, Mom, I've got the best place to sleep tonight. I got a great book, and I'm going to curl up on the bed with a cup of tea. And I'm going to have a wonderful night. And her mother smiled, said good night, and she walked out the door. So once again, your important point that, that the brain is not gone, just like a person whose left hand is paralyzed is doing things differently with their right hand, we are teaching our brains to think differently. And we, as people without the diagnosis who are supporting you, need to understand how you see the world and how you think. And that's why I put uh, my new definition of dementia, shift in the way a person experiences the world. Because if we don't try at least to have some understanding for that, we can never truly support somebody the way they need. We're just going to ask that guy in the wheelchair to walk up the steps every day instead of understanding that he needs a ramp. Al, I'm interested in your take on a question that was put in the chat box. Uh, a person said, I am called a dementia consultant under mental health team. I find it very difficult to believe that dementia is a mental health issue. The mental health team approach their clients in a totally different way. Would you place dementia-related illness under mental health? I do not. Um, and uh, I, I sympathize with the person uh, who has that identity and doesn't necessarily want to own it. We tend to talk about dementia as mental health, but I think when that happens, we conflate it with psychiatric illness. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you conflate it with things like schizophrenia, then that's a slippery slope to saying, well, the person says something that doesn't make sense. They must be delusional. They must need an antipsychotic. Uh, when, as I just explained, it often can mean something very different. I believe that very few people with dementia have true hallucinations or delusions. I have a definition for that that is way beyond most doctors, uh, which I have to do this talk for a couple hours before you won't think I'm crazy. But I gave you a little clue into that. Um, but uh, I, I guess the point I would make is that I believe that what's happening, there are structural changes in the brain. This is, there is, there is clearly neurologic illness going on. Um, and so I tend to think of it as more of a neurologic illness. And I love the idea of a disability or a different ability seeing it that way because then it becomes a political thing. It becomes a, can I stay at work with help? Can I get funding for uh, what I need to succeed in society? Can I be a social citizen or do I have to be locked away with other people who have this broad brush label that are really nothing like me? And imagine telling everybody with hypertension or everybody with blue eyes that they all have to live in a certain place. Uh, I, I propose to you that people with dementia are no more alike than those groups of people. And yet we've decided that they need a certain kind of approach to care. And, and there's no proof that that's better. Um, so, yeah, I, I believe it's a slippery slope to antipsychotic and other uh, pharmacologic. Now, people with dementia can get major depression. You can't ignore that. You can't, you can't uh, forget about it. And some people need antidepressant therapy for depression. Some people with uh, dementia have a history of psychotic illness. That's a different thing. But dementia as a category I don't see as mental health. I see something just came up in the chat box that I want to run to. Uh, early onset dementia, how your concepts would help. Um, now, once again, uh, there are a lot of people with early onset who are on the call. You may or may not agree with me, and, and please feel free to, to disagree. Um, there are some things that are different about people with early onset dementia. I think they're primarily occupational and social. You may be in a different place as far as the children who you're supporting. They may be a younger age. You may be still working uh, as opposed to a retired person with older onset. Um, but I believe that the needs of people beyond those social and occupational needs are not basically that different. I believe those seven domains of well-being apply to all people with a diagnosis and all people without the diagnosis. And so uh, when I see somebody, once again, I don't try to lump early onset more than I lump FTD or I lump Alzheimer's, I try to say, who is this person? What do they need to have well-being to succeed? How can I treat this person as an individual and meet their needs? And so, once again, I'm just somebody who tries to reject labels and categories. And I know that, that we need those things to classify people. We need those things to describe these different brain changes. But um, I don't hang my hat on them very much in my daily work because I'm, I've tried to be pragmatic. And as a, as a care partner with many people in my community living with dementia, uh, I get stuck if I have to if I have to put people in boxes before I know how to support them. 
There was a question right before that one, Al, from Gay Wellman. Do you see okay, uh, let me go back to it. Resources to assist long-term care staff to deal with a client become sexually aggressive. Yeah, there are many things. Both of my books talk about uh, sexuality. Um, part of it is uh, a misunderstanding of what's being in, uh, ten, attempted. Uh, it's not often about sex. It may be about relationship. It may be about touch or intimacy. <laughs> It may be uh, things that are misinterpreted. Uh, it may be about modesty and dignity. So the person responds a certain way because they're made to feel embarrassed or feel belittled or less masculine or feminine, let's say. Um, but um, what, uh, so I would suggest, and once again, not to hawk my books, but there, in, in the first book, I talk about some insights behind things that might seem sexually inappropriate. In the second book, I talk about sexuality and more the sense of intimacy versus sex, how we often confuse them. I talk about a nice story that Christine Bryden gave me for my book about her meeting her, her uh, current husband uh, after the diagnosis and how that affected her family when she announced to her family and friends, this woman with dementia, that she'd fallen in love and was going to get married, and, and some of the hackles that rose. And I also talk about uh, the Hebrew home in Riverdale in the Bronx. They have one of the most uh, forward-thinking policies on sexuality I've ever seen, and it's free. If you go to their website, they have two tools. Number one, their policy and procedure for the rights of people to express themselves sexually, and number two, a tool for assessing whether a person has the ability to enter into those activities uh, fully and safely. And, uh, and uh, that doesn't answer all your questions because time is short, but, um, but that uh, is definitely something you should look at. A lot of those things that happen come from the environmental and relational clues we give people. And uh, we have to look sometimes within ourselves and within the system and the environment to see what might be triggering these actions uh, that may be misinterpreted or may be misinterpreted by the person who's expressing them. So that's just a general way of saying, I mean, for instance, I've seen that some people that climb into bed with somebody else need either a body pillow because they're used to sleeping next to somebody at night, or they need to be outside their room during the day because they realized that their bedroom was somewhere else than where they spent the rest of their day. And so they were going, you know, to another, to another room to find their bed. And so often it's a misinterpretation. A question came up once again from Anna. Um, the Hebrew home in Riverdale in the Bronx. I haven't got the website right in front of me, but if you Google that, um, or if you look, both of those documents are referenced in my new book. If you have my new book, they're in the reference list uh, under the author's names. Al, one of the things that I heard from... Uh, I've heard from people who work in care facilities before is they get uh, confused on or perplexed on how to deal with uh, uh, people who live there that develop a relationship with another patient, another resident. And uh, sometimes this is a situation where uh, the person is married but they don't remember they're married and perhaps their spouse doesn't visit very often and they just find some comfort in and feeling close to, to another person in the facility but then the family gets very upset and says this can't happen you know that he or she's a married person and 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 then the staff feels torn because they think, well, if the person's happier feeling this relationship with, you know, an, another person in there, fine with us. But yet, then the, the the family gets upset. So it seems to be. Uh, yeah, and there's many different shades to that. I can't give one blanket answer. But for number one, uh, you know, once again, the Hebrew Homes policy talks about: Do they have the right to express themselves? Do they have the uh, the, uh, are they benefiting from it in a way that's safe for both of them? It's a great tool for that. Um, often it's about relationship. It's about intimacy, not sexuality, but it's misinterpreted. Often it's because uh, this is my mom or my dad and I don't want to see them doing this, which means it's more the family's problem or the staff's problem than the individual's. Uh, so it's important to ask all those questions and be sure. There's some lovely things that Sandra Day O'Connor has written. She's a former U.S. Supreme Court Justice whose husband had Alzheimer's, who started a relationship with another woman in the nursing home while uh, he was married to her. And she had a very open mind and sort of forward thinking. He's getting, he's getting a type of relationship and intimacy that I can't give him right now. 
Uh, not everybody can be that way, and it, it's a very individual thing. There's not one answer, but but we have to look at all these things. It looks like there's someone else is giving me a reference. Alzheimer's Australia, Victoria is having a conference. Let's talk about sex. Uh, Melbourne on 8th and 9th of September this year, and I would love to see what comes out of that because there's no one answer, and sometimes uh, there are things I struggle with too, but, but we just have to ask these questions. We have to understand that that like everything else, our need for autonomy, our need for growth, our need for relationship doesn't go away. And so many of us do things to, to disrupt intimacy, like rotating staff or, or being very professional and, you know, putting a wall in front of us, not sharing ourselves or building meaningful relationships with people, that they often reach out for the kind of connection that's been ripped away from them when they're taken away from their home and put in this place with strangers who don't relate to them. Um, so we have to really look at, and once again, that's the whole culture change part, is how do we change uh, to create a more relational environment where, where relationships matter, where they're the most important thing, as Dan Greenwood says in that video uh, about our care, they are the most important thing. Uh, and the clinical stuff follows. When you start there and you really understand the person in that relational context, you find those answers, but you have to find them through that person's eyes and through their needs. Thanks for that thoughtful answer. I, I, I agree totally. I, I've always felt like um, at, at the nursing or memory care home level, um, there are some very good ones, but in some of them, it's kind of like people are warehoused and they're supposed to conform to the way they want to run the place rather than the way it should be. Uh, so I appreciate yeah. your thoughtful answers on those. My friend Kim, my friend Kim McCray also talked about River Spring Health. Kim, I don't think that's the same as the Hebrew Home. Is that a different one? Um, but there's a website, riverspringhealth.org, that has a sexual expression policy. I'm not sure if that's the one I mentioned or if it's a different one, but uh, there are some resources out there. So the Hebrew Home is one, and uh, River Spring Health may be another one that you can look at for some references. And we're probably about out of time. It's 4.32 by my clock in the eastern United States. What do you think, John? Yeah. I've sure got 50 people. I mean, I don't have to run anywhere. I've been to the <laughs> jazz festival so much this week, I'm getting a little burned out, and I need a night off. So I'm going to stay on if the, if the webinar goes, but um, I'm also kind of anxious to find out why my website got dropped. So uh, if yeah, Absolutely. That. Well, and 90 minutes is long. I'll just ask real quickly if anybody had a burning question that they weren't able to ask yet, and then we'll wind it up. Oh. Um. Jamie, are you wanting to ask a question? Can yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my question is uh, the best ways to handle combativeness. Um, yeah, once again, big topic, but uh, when, when I look at things through a well-being lens, I tend to see what part of well-being is being challenged. And to me, the big challenge is when people tend to be striking out or, uh, or resisting verbally, uh, focus on the domains of security and autonomy okay. and a little bit on connectedness. So what may be happening is, number one, the person – and what I'll often do is I'll ask people in a seminar – Let's just pretend today, your age, no dementia, I'm going to pair you up with somebody next to you and you have to go away and let them strip you naked and bathe you. What are the kinds of things that would make you want to resist them? And the litany of answers I get is pretty much what I recommend to people. Well, if they're rushing me, if they don't uh, treat me like a person, if they don't engage me, if they don't ask for my input, if they don't check in with me to make sure everything's okay, if, they, if they're making me uncomfortable. So all those things. So any of those things that erode security, not explaining what's going on, um, not helping the person feel comfortable or modest or dignified, anything that erodes autonomy, not asking for input, not having the person actively directing the process, uh, telling the person what to do, anything that affects connectedness, rotating staff so the stranger is providing very intimate care, um, or having the person not connect with them as a person. I use a simple acronym, SEE, -E, which stands for S, slow down. The first E is engage. The second E is empower. And uh, that can work very well, too. So I have a lot of things in both books about that. But very quickly, I look at those well-being domains, and I say, if I can boost security, autonomy, and connectedness for this person all day, 24-7, then I'm going to bet that they're much likely to hit me um, when, I, um, when I am attempting to help them with care. 
Okay, thank you. And Al, yeah, I would just real quickly add, I, when I'm asked a question about that, I always say, imagine yourself in, their shoes. in the situation where you've lost the ability to communicate what's bothering you, or maybe it just doesn't connect what's bothering you. And um, you're, there's either something going on with how you're treated or something going on around you or there's something that's really bothering you, how are you, how is that going to come out? Probably in a behavior. So and that's why, that's why I reject the BPSD label, because if, if you would do it without dementia, then how can we blame that on the disease or the illness if, um, if it's, it would make us strike out too? And so once again, uh, we're doing some very difficult things. We asked somebody whose brain is changing to submit themselves to personal care that, would, that any one of us would find very challenging. Yeah. And to do it with absolutely no objections and, and the way we wish to do it. And so um, it's, uh, so that's why, I, once again, we have to look at ourselves. I think we can greatly change the experience of people with dementia primarily by changing ourselves. Because whose brain is more adaptable to change? The person who's got some neurological changes or the person who doesn't? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, just quickly, is your book available in, um uh, I, like I can read. I've lost reading, so can it? Uh, unfortunately, we do not have audio books. We do have a Kindle version you can get from Amazon. Haven't got there yet. It's a small publisher that has not explored uh, audio books. Uh, one of these days, if I can get some budget, I'll read the thing and we'll get it out to everybody. Hey, I'm, I'm, yeah, I know that's very hard. Um, uh, so, uh, so I'm, I don't know the answer. I'll to be inventing. <laughs> What you can do is start a reading club, and you can read. You know, you can have somebody read it to you, and then you can discuss it and uh, make that work. Al, I don't know if the feature is enabled on your book, but um, uh, I know uh, uh, Ghibli was saying that it's it's enabled on his new book, the where uh, Kindle will read the book to you. Wow! So I don't know if that will work on yours or not, but. Mm -hmm. I will check with my publisher, and I will let you know. And if you could let the participants know, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and someone else suggested talking to the services for the blind or visually impaired. Once again, I'll I'll, um, I'll do that know. right away. I yeah. work with them quite a bit, uh, so so anything has to be done through, of course, through my mm -hmm. publisher who owns the books. Mm -hmm. But I will talk to them about that because I think there's a growing need out there mm -hmm. for an audio book, and and I would love to push that forward if I could. Great. Right. Um, Al, can I just ask one quick question? Hey there, Mick. Hi, Mick. Good on, how are you going? Um, with, younger, uh, with um, younger onset, and especially uh, people that are, aren't in aged care facility, they are still living at home, and they do tend to um, go for a walk and not return, as I call it. Um, have you looked at... Uh, if they're in a, a what I call a dark place, and they're not um, they're not uh, handling their their diagnosis well, have you looked at the fact that they may just want to walk away and think, well, I'm I'm too big a burden on my family? Uh, absolutely, Mick, and and um, you know, I I tell a very powerful story in my new book about. Um, speaking in Ohio about this and having a reporter interview me on live TV before my talk and sticking a mic in my face and asking me my opinion about someone who had left his house the day before and could not be found. And uh, I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to blame anybody. And so I talked about autonomy and I talked about sometimes uh, the diagnosis can be overwhelming and, and that we're so quick to take things from people that we sometimes have a crisis reaction where we just have to get out and regain control over ourselves. And I didn't know how many ways that was going to come back to bite me in the bum, as they say. But, but it turned out the next day they found the gentleman. And what I found out uh, later was that um, the day before he took off, uh, the family had scheduled a hearing for guardianship to start making his decisions for him. And so he clearly, it was an autonomy issue for him. He was saying, I got to get away from this. And, and you know, once again, uh, our idea of security is keeping people locked up. Most uh, memory care places uh, are really mean a locked door, but often don't mean enlightened care. And, um, 
and uh, so we need to find safe ways for people to be able to physically expose themselves to the vent, mm -hmm. to get away from okay. environments that are stifling. Uh, and the technology is out there. If you can put a GPS with people, you can find them if you need to. Okay. Or if you can change your staffing so that you can free up a volunteer or somebody to take somebody for a walk. Um, there's no reason why we should have these blanket policies that say, one person might get hit by a car so nobody can leave the building, and which is the way we do these things. We always imagine the worst case scenario and then uh, punish everybody instead of coming up with more enlightened policies and then addressing the exceptions separately as individuals. And, and uh, so I agree, people get in those places and part of autonomy is emotional autonomy. Do we have the right to get upset, to express ourselves, to, to have those moments without being judged because of our label Instead of understanding that we all have those dark moments in our lives. Uh, and how do we support people to have a full range of emotions and not just be labeled a behavior because they have this label of dementia in front of them? I hope I answered what you were saying, Nick. Mm. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, we sure appreciate your time today. Mm -hmm. um, Great pleasure. It, and on, on behalf of everyone, we, we really appreciate it. So, we'll Thanks, John. You know, we're scratching the surface here. If there's some area I've touched on you want to blow up and do again in the later session, happy to come back anytime. Oh, and please support the group. Send your donations. Uh, they're a great group. And this is, this is such an important group that, that really um, – needs everybody's support because it's so counter to the narrative that is going on about dementia in many societies. It's so counter to the kinds of programs that are available. We have lots of support groups for family members. We have very little for people living with a diagnosis where they can actually speak freely to each other. Uh, and they are the core of this. This, this uh, whole program is run by people living with a diagnosis of one form or other. And we've heard from many of them today. And I so appreciate mm -hmm. the opportunity for you to teach me as well as for me to share information with you. Well, thank you very much, Al. And for those of you on here that aren't members, uh, uh, that's probably a good thing to mention. We do provide uh, uh, support groups of several different types for our members as part of our services. So uh, we provide a virtual weekly support group if they're interested that uses this same software. And it's small, same small group of people every week. So if you know of somebody that's uh, not able to get out to an in-person support group or doesn't have one in their area, we're a great alternative for them to be able to get support from other people living with dementia. So, um, but thanks for mentioning that, Al. So sure. with that, I, I'm sorry my video keeps freezing. My webcam needs to be replaced. I don't have any bandwidth issues, but it took me a while to figure out it's the webcam because... None of my other computers do that, but this is my good computer, so. John, can I, can I throw one more thing out there that came up uh, while Mick's still on the line? Sure. Uh, somebody was concerned, Mick, that I may have misinterpreted you and that you were talking about a dark place, meaning wanting to harm yourself and not burden your family. Is that what you were referring to? It can be a lot of things, Al. Um, I always refer to it as a black hole where people... Um, how can I put it? Uh, they're very insecure and they're very... Uh, they don't know what's going on and they're not sure. They can't handle change and they end up in a very dark place. Some people <clears throat> do want to hurt themselves. Some just want to get away. And, uh, you know, so they're not a burden on their family. Um, it's, it can vary between people. It's, I find it a lot when I give um, talks, when I talk to people that they do talk about it. And it's, I was just interested to hear your take on it. Yeah. Well, to respond to Kirsten, then, in addition to what I said, there is that dimension that some people do feel a burden. They, people can have major depression. It happens to about half of all people with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And uh, that needs to be recognized. People, as you know, do commit suicide. Uh, the famous... Dr. Gavorkian case in the U.S. was a 59-year-old woman who was diagnosed, and even though she wasn't greatly impaired, she had been convinced by society that her life would be so miserable that she decided to end it all. Um, so these things do happen, and I think that's why it's so important to change the narrative, to understand that you can live, live positively with a diagnosis, 
and that well-being can be accessible to everybody. And I think that uh, by doing that and, we, and by partnering with people, as Christine suggests in her Dancing with Dementia book, uh, we can take some of this feeling of burden away from people and hopefully uh, find ways to partner on this journey, which, uh, which so many of us will take over the next several years. To add to what John said um, about the support groups, I actually run one here in Australia and I had some new members join yesterday from Perth, from Arwini uh, in Perth, and we'd only been going about 15 minutes and they said to me, we like this so much, it's very empowering to talk to like-minded people about issues that have affected us and no one understands. And she said, it's really, really good. And I was, I felt pretty stoked about that. And John, so should you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've talked about this in my new book and Richard Taylor talks about it with his hello dinners. Um, it's great to have, you know, family members have a support group with their family member also alone so they can share their own struggles and frustrations without making the person feel bad. But the place where we fall short is a place for people only living with a diagnosis to sit together in a room and also privately and very honestly share their frustrations, their, their concerns that they, life is not worth living. To be able to say that without a moderator filtering or, or maybe hampering that free, flame, free range idea. So, so uh, this is a place where most Alzheimer's societies have fallen short, not providing a good forum. And that's, once again, as Kim McRae just sent me a message, this is why these DAI uh, calls are so important because this is one place for people who are in that place who mm -hmm. want to share some frustrations to come to hopefully a non-judgmental open group where we can, you can share yourself. And uh, Kim is saying to me, she's so thankful that these amazing people are on the call, you and John and Kate and, and all the other people uh, who, um, who are living with a diagnosis who are so mm -hmm. forward about the experiences because we need to learn from you. You know, um, we, we don't, we'll never to totally know this until we live with the diagnosis ourselves. And so if we're not paying attention to you, we're doing a big disservice to everyone. And yeah. you might we, we are able to uh, understand why things are funny and why they're not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Mick, you might mention also how empowering it was for you when you became involved with DAI and how it kind of changed your life. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that if you don't mind. Yeah. I was in a very dark place myself until Kate introduced me to DAI and then John introduced me to uh, Richard, where's Richard? Uh, Richard Taylor's group. And it turned my life around 180 degrees, as you know, Al. Um, uh, it gave me a lot of confidence, and I now am very, very positive, and I'm a very strong advocate for, um, uh, for living positively with dementia because it can be done. And, yeah, it's so empowering, John, just to talk to people with, uh, people with a similar or, or same symptoms and... Um, one of these ladies yesterday had had four questions to ask which she hasn't been able to ask anybody since she's been diagnosed and I think there was uh, seven or eight people in it and everyone had a different perspective on, on the four questions but they were similar to what we all had and she found that so empowering because she hasn't been asked because she hasn't been able to ask anybody else who understands. Yeah, but the most important message from this uh, group is you are not alone. That's yeah. true, Al, well, you're right. Exactly. Well, we do need to wind things up here, so yeah. I do appreciate Thanks, John. Thanks for doing yeah. work. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Uh, thank you, Thanks, Al. I'll leave my under later, Al. Yeah, and we will take you up on, on getting you back on here, Al, that's for sure. Anytime. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for attending and hope to see you next time. You. Enjoy your day or evening. Thanks, John. Thanks, Al. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.